Conflicts on the rise in China between locals and authorities. This as temples are being demolished in China. CCP virus cases re-emerging in China. Now more and more places are added to the list. At the same time, the outbreak in Wuhan earlier this year seems to have a happy ending, but only in TV series and performances. It's part of Chinese Communist Party propaganda intent on praising itself. And a German citizen recounts the seven years he spent in a Chinese prison. Now he's telling his story and describes the physical and mental torture he endured there. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Suppression of freedom of religion by the Chinese Communist Party is rampant. Over the years, temples have been frequently and forcibly demolished. According to a report, two more of them have also been destroyed, leaving an elderly monk homeless. Inside China's eastern Zhejiang province, authorities from one county sent about 100 workers to forcibly demolish two buildings, a guest house and a kitchen, both part of a local temple. The guest house was home to an elderly monk. This according to reports by human rights magazine Bitter Winter. The 80-year-old temple keeper wasn't informed about the demolition ahead of time. His possessions are now buried beneath the rubble. He's been living in a small tent on the premises since June. And in the southeastern province of Jiangxi, county authorities also forcibly demolished another temple, this one more than 700 years old. They claim that a new temple will be built in its place. According to Bitter Winter magazine, the temple director placed a statue of communist leader Mao Zedong near the site to please the CCP. He did it out of fear that the regime would refuse to rebuild the temple. He even posted a slogan saying, Be loyal to the Communist Party, follow the party forever, obey the party's command, and study the major spirit of the party. But his attempts to please CCP officials were fruitless. The construction of the new temple was stalled and little progress was made. At one point, officials changed their minds and decided to tear it down yet again. More than 10 officers showed up to carry out the order. Those who tried to block the demolition were beaten. In yet another county, authorities demolished a more than 20,000 square foot temple. When locals tried to defend the building, police officers beat them. One resident was beaten so badly that he sustained a concussion. The police also confiscated and broke locals' smartphones in order to prevent them from recording video or taking photos of the incident. And in Liaoning province, a temple was forcibly converted into a nursing home. All religious statues were removed. One victim expressed to Bitter Winter that the regime's efforts to crack down on religions aim to prevent religious beliefs from developing in China, as the regime demands that its citizens view the Communist Party as their highest ruler. Now we take a look at the CCP virus in China. Anhui province is claiming a virus patient there was infected in Shanghai. Anhui is about a five-hour drive away. This comes a day after Shanghai authorities confirmed domestic cases on November 9th. One case in Shanghai is a 51-year-old man named Wang. His village has since been put on lockdown and all residents have been tested for the virus. A local told us he doesn't know how long the lockdown will last. Another resident told us she's worried about the virus spreading. This as Shanghai recently hosted the China International Import Expo a week ago. Wang, the virus patient, worked at the airport where the majority of guests would have come through. Shanghai's health commission director said at a press conference over a million people attended the event. Anhui province says their case is a 50-year-old man who worked with Wang in Shanghai. The health commission says the man felt ill after returning from Shanghai. He tested positive at the hospital. Where and how Wang was infected remains a mystery. Now to China's southern Yunnan province. Inside Rayleigh City, mass virus testing began on Monday. That's after new virus cases were reportedly detected there. One Chinese netizen posted a video of a testing facility on Twitter, shot earlier in the week. According to the person who captured the video, laborers working for local authorities were the first group to be tested. Chinese media outlets reported virus outbreaks in the city back in September. Those reports prompted a seven-day lockdown. At the time, local authorities claimed the virus had been brought in by migrants entering the country illegally from Myanmar, formerly known as Burma. Rayleigh City residents were asked to stay at home and wait to be tested. 
Chinese authorities have a history of concealing the true situation of the pandemic. For that reason, the area's official virus data could have been underreported. Now we turn to another region inside Yunnan province. According to a Monday update from the province's health commission, two Myanmar, formerly Burma nationals, have been diagnosed with the virus. They were found in a small border region called Munding County. Both were asymptomatic cases. Two days before they were confirmed positive, overnight group testing was conducted in the county's factory district. The area went under lockdown the following day, meaning residential areas were sealed and a 14-day at-home quarantine was imposed. All locked down both ways and it seems serious. Everyone is required to take tests. Nowhere to buy stuff because everything is closed. Only pharmacies and grocery stores are allowed to open for a while. Close to 70 schools are also temporarily shut down. Now we turn to Wuhan, the epicenter of the pandemic, and how the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has turned accounts of suffering and tragedy into political propaganda used for self-praise. In one example, a six-hour documentary series was made to show off party members and officials' efforts to fight the infection. CCP media mouthpieces reported that one of the goals of the documentary series was to showcase the political advantages of the regime's leadership and the socialist system. In another case, a 20-episode TV series tells fictional stories about Wuhan doctors, soldiers, police officers, factory owners, delivery men, and construction workers who work together to combat the virus spread. The show featured a small number of well-known Chinese celebrities. There was also a drama performance talking about how people fought against the epidemic. The title of the drama is People at the First Place. The audience said they were in tears while watching the shows. The two and a half months lockdown of the city earlier this year brought great emotional trauma and huge economic loss to the people of the city. Wuhan reported only 2,500 death cases of the CCP virus. But from the number of urns, estimated death toll is at least 10 times that of the official figure. But no word has been mentioned on the anger about their families about government cover-up of the pandemic. The skewed interpretations have left little to no room to grieve, and even less room for reflection about the faults and responsibilities of Chinese authorities. The TV programs and shows also fail to mention the whistleblower doctors who were punished for warning their friends and the public about the virus' severity. Nor did any of the series acknowledge the citizen journalists who were arrested for reporting on the virus death toll. Some of their whereabouts are still unknown. Since the beginning of the pandemic, Chinese officials appear to have been considering how to spin Wuhan's story to their advantage. For example, regime officials instructed filmmakers to create the fictional TV series Together in February 2020. At the time, Wuhan's virus death rate was still on the rise. The show's screenwriter visited the city in March, when it was still under lockdown. Hong Kong pro-democracy lawmakers were set to resign on Thursday after a final staged protest against Beijing's extended curb on dissent. Britain has accused China of breaking a major bilateral treaty for the third time. Hong Kong's opposition lawmakers staged a final protest on Thursday. They will then collectively resign to protest the dismissal of four colleagues. Carrie Lam's government expelled the four opposition members from the legislature on Wednesday for what they called endangering national security. This happened after Beijing gave Hong Kong executive powers to further curb dissent. They can do so without having to go through the courts. Pro-democracy lawmakers see the dismissal of the four as another bid by Beijing to suppress democracy in the region. Lawmaker Lam Chiting briefly displayed a banner in the building reading, Carrie Lam is corrupting Hong Kong and hurting its people. She will be nailed to history's pillar of shame. Carrie Lam was not there at that moment. Pro-democracy lawmaker Claudia Mo arrived with her resignation letter, dressed in black, a color symbolic of last year's anti-extradition protests, and with a nod to the 2014 umbrella movement. Uh, I'm sad, but also uh, relieved. Relieved in the sense that uh, this council uh, at the moment is very, very painful uh, to deal with because it's so full of uh, 
uh, fake uh, uh, speeches and uh, it's so full of uh, uh, faux sincerity, fake sincerity. All they do is just uh, uh, be, uh, being the uh, government's mouthpiece. Another pro-democracy lawmaker, Wu Chi Wai, says the fight against the authoritative government will be a long battle. And of course we all know that for the authoritative type of government, they will suppress all the opinions, views coming from the opposition powers or, or parties. And we have to understand and beware of that. But we can only stand with it and fight for freedom, fight for democracy in a long span. Britain on Thursday said China had broken the Sino-British Joint Declaration by imposing the new rules. It breaches both China's commitment that Hong Kong will enjoy a high degree of autonomy and the right to freedom of speech, guaranteed under paragraph three of the declaration. This is the third time the government has called a breach of the Joint Declaration since 1997. But the second time we've been forced to do so in the last six months. The UK's junior foreign minister said Britain has summoned China's ambassador, Liu Xiaoming, to register its concerns. In his first interview with an English language media outlet, a German citizen talks about the seven and a half years he spent in a Chinese prison. In the third section of our three-part series, Robert Rota describes the physical and mental torture he endured in prison. NTD's Germany correspondent Christian Watchin reports. Robert Roter spent seven years and seven months in a Chinese prison, from 2011 to 2018. Much of that time was spent in Dongguan Prison in southern China's Guangdong province. There he witnessed torture, abuse and other forms of mistreatment on a regular basis. Roter described how prison guards used physical and psychological torture to enforce total submission. When an inmate refused to work or broke one of the prison's 38 rules, he would be severely punished. One of those punishments included the use of the infamous tiger chair. To use it, guards tie a prisoner's arms and legs to the chair, which is made of iron. The chair has some pipes which are sort of sharp shape, and if you sit on them for a long time, it's really painful. Then some people had to sit on these chairs for one week, two weeks, non-stop. The prisoner's limbs would eventually go numb and swell up as the pipes press into the person's limbs. Roter said tiger chairs were put on public display to intimidate prisoners, but the chairs would be stowed on the roof before scheduled visits from inspectors. And cameras would be pointed in the opposite direction whenever torture practices were being used. According to Human Rights Watch, Chinese police regularly use tiger chairs on suspects and prisoners, including prisoners of conscience. In other cases, when a prisoner refused to apologize or show remorse, Roter explains police would use electric batons, often causing lasting damage. So it takes a taser and holds the taser to, the, to your brain. We call it frying the brain. Or they use the taser on other spots on your body. It's kind of common to, yeah, to destroy you. If you get tasered on your brain, then the person really become, I would say, stupid. Yeah? They lose their mind. They cannot talk properly anymore. They, they become very slow in their movements. And you see that they are brain is damaged. Roter himself was restrained with 20-pound chains and tied to a bed. The punishment came in retaliation after he complained about the prison's lack of medical care. You cannot sit up, you cannot walk anymore, you're just like this. The feeling to be in chain is just a humiliation, yeah? even especially for things you don't do, and to not be able to walk straight. And Luckily for Roter, his lawyer found out about the punishment and got him out after half a day. But he was still forced to apologize for what guards called lying about not receiving care. Roter described meeting inmates who had been kept in solitary confinement cells for up to two months. While inside the cells, which were often kept at a temperature around 100 degrees, they were bound in chains and deprived of shower privileges and clean clothing. Guards would also prevent them from sleeping, urinate in their drinking water, and beat them. Later, guards would parade them around the prison wearing signs around their necks that read, I am ashamed of what I've done. Roter shared that prison guards also employed a range of psychological torture methods. He witnessed many prisoners who broke down under the pressure. They want to break you. And many people, they break. They mentally get a crack and then they give up. And then they become just, uh, 
you see they are somehow dead. They have no more, no more self in them. Their self is gone. They just Roeder said he repeatedly reported the torture and forced labor practices he experienced to the German consulate in the city of Guangzhou. In response to questions about the topic from NTD, the German Foreign Ministry said it hadn't received any concrete evidence of torture and forced labor from German citizens who are or were held in Chinese prisons. Amnesty International and other groups have reported widespread torture inside Chinese prisons, detention centers and labor camps. Officially, Beijing is a signatory of the UN Convention Against Torture. There are currently 13 German citizens in prison in China. Roeder's experiences are consistent with accounts from other former Dongguan inmates who shared their stories with the media after being released. New Zealander Danny Kansian is one example. He was released in 2012. Roeder also explained how he managed to cope amid the dire situation. For one, his German citizenship and the presence of the German consulate checking up on his well-being served as a kind of life insurance policy. He said that whatever happened inside the prison, the guards didn't want to end up with a dead German citizen on their hands. He added that they consider the lives of Chinese inmates to be more disposable. Over time, Roeder said he learned to cultivate a constructive attitude. Start to look inside of yourself and start to tackle your thoughts. What am I thinking? What am I, my fears? And start to overcome them and confront them. And then you will see how fast your environment is changing and your life will get much better. He said he witnessed inmates who destroyed themselves by viewing those around them as enemies. But he chose a different approach. I did not um, see the police officer itself as an enemy. Of course, some were bad. Other police officers were also kind of nice. I have to say that. That is the individuum of them. So even there, you have to, sometimes you have to start to forgive. Yeah? The police officer is in front of you. is not responsible that you are here. That is a system. Roeder was released in December of 2018. He spent a total of seven years and seven months in prison, a number he called auspicious. But readjusting to life in Germany wasn't easy. Roeder says it took time to get used to the demands of daily life again. The first time he went shopping, he described being overwhelmed by all the choices. He left soon after. Roeder spent his first year on an island in northern Germany, writing a book about his experience. He said he owed it to his fellow inmates to tell the story of how prisoners in China are treated. He also mentioned what he called his biggest takeaway from the experience. Just treat every human being the same way as you want to be treated, and then you will get the response quickly. If you give people respect, they will also give you respect. If you give people problems, they will also give you problems in return. Roeder now works as a day trader. He says he hopes his story can help wake people up about the realities of forced labor and torture in Chinese prisons, and how other nations' relationships with China are contributing to gross violations of human rights. He says, above all, he hopes it shows people that we can do something about it. Reporting by Christian Watchin, NTD News, Berlin. And that's all for today's China Info Kiss. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.